Good morning. Um, okay. So, uh, I'm Mrs. Potts from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Just to say very quickly, because you probably, you probably haven't heard of us. Um, we're a not-for-profit. We were founded in 2004. Uh, we build communities and tools that help people create, use, and share information. And we work you know, pretty much on every kind of uh, data or content, from solids to statistics, genes to geodata. Uh, and we're community-based. Uh, there's some 15 plus projects and working groups. And one of the areas we work in that we're particularly interested in is open bibliography. Uh, there's an active working group at openbibio.net, and there's a, an open bibliography service at bibliographic.org that I'll talk about more later. Now, one thing I just want to say quickly, because open uh, can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, just as, just as freedom can, I guess. So, I want to be very specific about it, uh, so specific that I and some other people want to write a definition of what we meant by openness. Um, uh, which, and it means freedom for anyone, anyone, to use, reuse, and redistribute. And anyone means anyone. It doesn't mean just educational people or just people who are non-commercial. It means anyone. It does not mean Creative Commons licenses, for example. Some Creative Commons licenses are open, some are not. And the reason this is important, I'll come to, but I should emphasize now, it's about interoperability. It's about the fact that when you travel around the UK, your power socket fits into the wall, but when you go abroad, it doesn't, right? In the UK, when you go to someone else's house, you don't need to take a power adapter, right? You know that your socket will fit in the wall. And that's because you know there's a standard, you know there's interoperability. The key point here is that if we want, if I want to meet, if I meet someone else and they say to me, hey, I've got open content or I've got open data, I go, great, I want to use that too and I want to use it with my open content and data. I don't want to have to go and find a lawyer and discuss with them whether I can do that. I want to know right now that I can do that. And that's what the open definition basically delivers for you. If, if you provide these freedoms and the only thing basically you're allowed to therefore restrict is you can ask for attribution, and you can ask for share alike, you know that your open material will be, will be interoperable. Um, okay, so, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning was the word. Uh, strictly about 5,000 years ago in Sumo, we think people invented writing. And the word was very costly. I mean, in general, go back to Sumo, it was, you know, for, for a long period, being a scribe was a very uh, valuable profession. And obviously, right up into the Middle Ages, people hand copied books. Only a very few number of people in the world had access to certainly the, not the, even the printed word, but the copied word, uh, or they depended on oral transmission. But then the printing press happened, right? Um, and then we got computers. Uh, this is a 1960s model of the IBM. And reproduction, reproduction of the word went on getting cheaper and cheaper. And until now, the cost is approximately zero. In the midst of our digital revolution, the cost of reproduction of digital text is approximately zero. And of data, it's approximately zero. I mean, of course, it's approximate. There are, you know, if you have terabytes of stuff, it's going to be expensive. And you know, this is obvious, I think, to all of us now. It's no doubt been, you know, not only are we confronted with it every day, but it is worth reflecting upon what that implies. So what does it imply particularly for libraries and publishing? Well, once upon a time, reproduction is costly. And one of the reasons that we set up libraries or we set up journals was basically to facilitate access, storage, and reproduction. I mean, in particular, reproduction was really expensive. I mean, going back to the beginnings of science, people wrote letters to each other, and that was therefore, again, limited to a small elite who could get their letters uh, transported around. Um, and then, you know, printing material was expensive. You needed large amounts of capital. You need to get it together and you needed to club together into societies or groups to be able to just simply afford reproduction of the material. Um, but that's gradually changed. In a world in which costs of reproduction are zero, that can't really be your purpose anymore. In which even the cost of storage, uh, though not completely zero, are, are, are less and less, we've got to be doing something else. And, and that something else is basically matching, filtering and finding. Ironically, what we face now is an information glut, in some sense. We have too much information. Uh, we have too much material around. I mean, estimates of, of even now annual information production of some kind of informal sense of what we mean by information production on the web, you know, outstrip the kind of entire humanity's output up to kind of 1900. Um, now, of course, the point about that is quality and quantity, right? You can have a lot of information, but most of it 
might be about Paris Hilton or whatever. You know, we're not, maybe stuff, certainly as scientists or whatever, we're not interested in, but even as scientists, there's a lot of information maybe I don't want to know about, or there's a very small amount I want to see right now. And so matching, filtering, and finding are what we care about. And think of the G word, of course, by which I mean Google, right? I mean, this is, this is an entity whose basically raison d'etre is to match us with other material we're interested in. Um, of course, harnessing human beings to do that. I mean, Google essentially is, in some senses, is essentially a parasitic entity in that it, its entire algorithm depends on humans creating links, humans doing the filtering and finding, but build on that. And in fact, most of, most of the online systems for doing this are interesting in that way. They have a huge human component, but they harness that. And I don't know, I'm sure you have librarians saying something I say got told by a librarian was Ryan Gannathan his his rules, which you know, it's kind of old, it's kind of a, you know, relatively old, so it's a period when this was still happening, but to every reader his book, to every book its reader, um, and save the time of the user, these are all about matching. These are all about matching readers with their material, matching writers with their material. So, how does openness come into this? If we're in a world where reproduction, if you like, the problem relatively is solved, um, and we're in a world where matching and filtering are what matter. Um, in a world of zero reproduction cults, matching is king, then just as nature abhors a vacuum, so the digital abhors a friction, I would argue. In particular, openness equals zero friction. If I want to go and do things with material, in particular, I want to build algorithms or build systems, doesn't have to be algorithm, I want to build systems that allow people to match material. Normally, I need access to the material, and normally I need the people who are doing said matching, or assisting me, or participating in my system, to be able to do that. So, you know, we can imagine a world in which Google did need to seek permission from every person they crawled in order to build their, build their index. It's a world some people have tried to enforce, in fact. Um, now, you know, le leaving aside in some sense whether the moral rightness or not of it, one can imagine that A, it would have been infeasible for them to exist, and we would have all missed out on something. You know, how, however maybe the cake got divided and people got compensated, not being able to do that um, would, would, would be kind of, would be a huge loss to us. We can see that that kind of friction for building that kind of engine would have destroyed the engine. And so I would say that in a digital world in which basically cost of reproduction is zero, in fact cost of transmission come close to zero, openness equals zero friction, and zero friction is what you want, what users want, and what maybe more important um, innovators want. So every paywall that I have to climb, I mean until recently I was, I was a full-time academic, every PDF I have to extract, every password I have to type in is slowing me down. Um, and it's not just slowing me down, it's slowing down innovators. It's slowing down the builders and tools and services that make my and others' lives easier. Now, I understand um, that people have to be paid. I, um, so I should say, you know, the electricity has to be generated, the machines have to run, people have to be engaged to do these things. But in a lot of this area, that isn't really an objection to what's being proposed in a world of kind of complete openness for the, both the content and the data here, at least in, for example, the academic sector. Um, much of this production is already being paid for, frankly. Um, you know, the only parts of it that seem to be kind of, that often get argued over, are kind of seemingly fairly small parts of this chain of filtering and matching. I mean, ironically, the filtering and matching that I see in the world gets in the way. You know, what I don't understand is why do I need to depend um, or, you know, even when I play that role, why am I, as one of two reviewers, or someone as the editor of the journal, playing this role of a matcher, you know, deciding what I will discover, in some sense, because I only go to a certain number of journals, when I could depend on my friends? When I could have a system, in a world that was, that was truly frictionless, I could simply be getting the recommendations of my friends, I could simply all the peers, or I could be forming my own journals. Um, you know, in some sense, not a journal's overnight. I could simply say, right, I'm going to start reviewing these kind of, these kind of, uh, you know, these kind of articles, and I'll do it with these three other people, and you know, I will build reputation that way. Why can I not review reviewers? Why is it the case that I can't downvote? 
people who I think do rubbish reviews, even if they're anonymous. I could simply say, I don't know who this person is, but from now on, I never want to, uh, every time in fact they review this article badly, I want to read it. <laughs> um, you know, we can see this in, in so many areas. Um, in, in a sense, what's kind of astonishing to us is that in some sense we encounter, I mean, at least to those in the tech space, we encounter some of these systems in action every day, um, but they're so limitedly applied to the realm in which we exist. I mean, going back, I remember, I mean, I don't know if you're here, kind of put up your hand if you've heard of Slashdot. Okay, some people have heard of Slashdot. But at least, you know, Slashdot had this whole thing of kind of people posted links and they reviewed them and they reviewed other people who reviewed them and they dealt with anonymity, which is always people, you know, reviewers have to be anonymous and so on. They had all of these issues and those systems, of course, just like Google, can some extent be gamed. But who can't game the existing journal system? Um, you know, we all, we all know that all systems are subject to some degree of exploitation. So more important, I think, than this question that, that some of this production is already paid for, um, but it's that the data and content are ultimately a platform in some sense. I mean, they're what ultimately people want to get to, but in terms of in terms of making money, in terms of paying for the electricity and paying for the people, um, even in this intermediary state, even if we agree that much of the production is already funded elsewhere, normally by the state in fact, or by people engaged in some other activity, such as pharma companies, um, this material can be built on, not sold. It's, it, it, it's a platform, not a commodity. Um, there are plenty of ways to make money without going closed. Now, some of that's difficult, I, I would imagine, because some of that involves disruptions. Sometimes the people will be making money and not the people who are currently making the money. Uh, and obviously, so that's not a trivial thing. I mean, economists, who, of which I was once one, uh, you know, often fond of saying, you know, things about kind of trade agreements. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of net, net improving for the economy. I mean, of course, the issue is that the, the people who may gain jobs are not the people who lose them, which is a fairly fundamental, you know, important point in any kind of, in any kind of transition. But it is the case that the riches, in some sense, possible to us in building on this material is much greater than I think from simply trying to sell it as a commodity. Um, so, while, while from what I've said, I've, I, I mean, I, I could go into more detail, but I, I don't really want to talk. You know, I have my backup slides if necessary. But in, in why this is so important and why, in some sense, it's inevitable. But I'm not naive, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, people like me have been coming along probably and saying this for, if not, uh, you know, a decade, probably longer, uh, preaching this gospel in some sense that inevitably the digital revolution is going to push us in this direction. But I want to focus therefore in, in, this, in this kind of section of the talk on, on a specific area where it's more feasible that right now, right here, uh, we, can have, we can have quite a significant change in, in the way things are operating. So I want to talk about the data and the metadata in, in, in relation to bibliography and in relation to, pub to publishers and particularly libraries. So both the content and the metadata will one day be free, um, but one day can be a long time. Um, as Keynes famously said, you know, in the long run we're all dead, and in the long run this is going to happen, but, but we may not live to see the day. Um, so metadata is the easy way in. Um, I was going to say it was the kind of soft underbelly uh, of, 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 kind of, of material, kind of quoting Churchill, but then I remembered he said this obviously about Italy and it took rather a long time to conquer Italy uh, in the end. Um, so I, I couldn't talk about that, but why? why? Why is it that the metadata is the easy way in here? Well, first of all, in, in some sense it's really important, it's really useful. So in some, most of the time, I don't know if, if your publishers, I mean, I remember talking with someone from CUP once upon a time. And, in a way, they just couldn't understand why I was interested in metadata. I mean, it just seemed, you know, compared to the, the text, the monographs, it seemed really irrelevant to them. Um, but it's the skeleton. I'm saying the metadata here, by that I just mean the title, the author, when it was published. Um, you know, other interesting information, how many times it's been downloaded, that's, that, that kind of thing. But just fundamentally, what books are there, who wrote them, what monographs are there, who wrote them, when, who has a copy of them, who's selling them, is it in print, that kind of stuff. Basically, every kind of service you would want to build, any kind of application you would want to build, requires that kind of information, requires that. Do you want to offer a book purchase service, as, as, as we heard earlier? Um, do you want to interlink with Wikipedia? I mean, would you just like to know how, which of your stock is actually mentioned in the Wikipedia article? Um, what is the effect of being mentioned in the Wikipedia article on book sales? I don't know, if someone done that study, I'd be interested. Um, do you want to do analytics? 
Um, as we just saw, you know, the great presentation before, really fascinating insight to what's going on. All of that ultimately requires identifiers, it requires some information about the material. I mean, in my case specifically, I just want to know how much material is out there. I was doing research, just how many books have been published uh, that we have still record of, um, by whom and when. And it's less, I don't know, it seems less commercially valuable. I mean, obviously there are people, OCLC, um, Nielsen, there are people out there building business models on this. But in general, there's more copies of it around. Most libraries actually have a lot of metadata sitting around of this kind. And even metadata, it turns out, OCLC doesn't have its dibs on in some way or other, um, if you go and ask. And so this, it's less commercially valuable. And I say, it doesn't mean it's less actually valuable, it's just less commercially valuable because you can charge less for it because there's more competition. Remember, this, you know, commercial and social value are not the same thing. Um, so the level of reuse and the importance of bug fixing. Data is a lot like code. Data equals code to some extent. Um, so the level of reuse that we can do, the things that we can do with this data is in some ways greater on average than with content. The, the, the different things that can be done, the things that someone else can do. Uh, you know, remember the many minds principle, the best thing to do with your data will be thought of by someone else. That's, that's not so true with content. You know, there's only so many things, to, at least to start with, you could do with content, you know, mainly read it. Um, whereas with data, there's just so many services and apps that we can build, and there's only more normally that you can conceive of in your organization or that I can conceive of. Um, and it's the importance also of bug fixing. Uh, I mean, obviously there are bugs in content, it's why we have proof editors or whatever, but in some sense they're a lot less minor, and anyone who's looked at any reasonable corpus of data just knows there are lots of, lot, you know, there are always errors in it. And those errors are normally very costly to fix, I mean, it's why we have full-time librarians often doing metadata, um, checking and making sure it's really good quality and making sure the, the um, as it were, the vandals don't get into the citadel. Um, so, one project, in this regard, uh, that we've, we've been involved in, that I, that I wanted to talk about, because, you know, we've been, uh, as I said, the Open Knowledge Open Foundation was founded in 2004, and I, I was interested in this from the beginning, and one of the things I was interested in was what, what public domain material is there in the world? And, you know, obviously there's copyrights, so we're really restricted in what we can do with, with that content, you know, we, 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 we need to go and ask people about it and seek permission and so on, but there's all this public domain, domain material out there, lots of it in theory. Um, you know, millions, millions of works, some of them of great, great interest to us, and perhaps lots of even obscure ones of greater importance because people don't actually have access to them. Everyone has access to Charles Dickens. Um, but how do you find out what's in the public domain? I mean, what, you know, is there somewhere I can go and look up? You know, let's say I'm interested in going and digitizing this on some kind of, you know, crowdsourced basis where people in their basement start taking photographs of books or, they go off with recordings. I was particularly interested in recordings because if you're not aware, the EU right now, under large pressure from basically recording industry, is seeking to extend copyright term in sound recordings for no good reason at all. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to go and digitize that, if, you know, is it in the public domain? How do you find out? If, you, if I've got a copy of Glenn Gould's Goldberg Variations in front of me, uh, I will tell you that it was released in 1957. Um, you know, is that in the public domain? And there is no. Uh, there's no place you can go and, and be told that. Um, and so you suddenly realize that to do that, you need metadata, you need actual catalog data, basically, because you need people's, you need the authors of works, you need to know their death dates. You also need to know, in fact, for recordings, a really tricky thing, which is normally not well recorded in catalogs, which is the work they derive from. So, you know, recordings are of other compositions, and you need to know whether the composition is in the public domain, or, you know, whether uh, it's recording. So, for, for example, one of the things people went on about three or four years ago was, oh, this is that's all right, which was going to the public domain. It turned out only the recording part was going to the public domain, and the actual composition was by some chap who died in 1974, so the full recording, in some sense, won't be in the public domain until 2044. Uh, wonderful that there is. Um, so, you need a catalogue of data. So, this, this really simple thing, to build a catalogue public domain work, so we could go about digitizing needs of this. So one of the things that I encountered was, is there a resource that gives you open catalog data, despite it not being that commercially valuable out there? And the answer is no. In fact, I don't know, there's probably a post I went to the British Library and I was interested in a recording catalog. I said, hey, why don't we do a wiki-like project where you'll give out your catalog, recording catalog data and we'll work on it together. And they said, great, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go and discuss it. And they were just about to approve it when the then head of the sound archive spoke up and said, wait a moment, I don't actually know whether we own our catalogue data, because we might have bought it from someone. 
and the following year they went off and discovered that they bought it in from someone and they weren't really sure which bits of it were theirs because you know they'd entered some bits of it and bought some bits of it in and, you know, and by the way the data was really rubbish because I'd scraped it by that point um, you know I don't know there were there were clearly things from 1984 that were catalogued as 1900 probably because they just hadn't had a date and so on and so forth so it'd been real value add for them so one of the things you discover in this area is that it'd be very difficult just to get open data even though for all the reasons I told you it's a great idea so what's kind of extraordinary about this I'm just setting you up is that this year, in fact, about four or five months ago, the British Library did open up its entire British National Bibliography, three million records. And the irony is, despite there being several projects out there, probably people know of library thing, they mostly probably also know of Open Library. To be frank, the, the provenance of the data there is a bit is a bit dubious. I mean Open Library have a fairly ooh, ooh, have a fairly gung-ho attitude to to public domain in the United States in which they kind of think that all library catalog data is public domain, therefore they go and scrape it from pretty much wherever it's, it's open, which, I don't know, might turn out to be true, which is great, but this is, these are really open. We have a license from the originator, they know what's going on. Um, we also have talks, by the way, with a lot of other libraries, uh, because the great problem, it turns out, is a lot of them get data from all libraries have done this great thing, which is share work, but in doing so, they've kind of intermingled all their record catalog data with lots of other people, and, including OCLC, who tend to have not such an open approach, at least at the moment, to, to catalogue data. Um, so three million open records, pretty much mo most of the books is the British National Bibliography. It's not serials. Uh, it's not, uh, I really like an open source of serials, because that's what academics want. Um, and we've done things, I mean, in a way this is a demonstrator. Um, it, we've integrated Wikipedia, you know, we, we have a kind of tool, you just turn it on, you go to Wikipedia and every, in every article it just looks up the ISBN, so it says, hey, you know, is this, is this in Bibliographica or not, is, is it linked? Um, you know, whether you had open data or not, it would be kind of an interesting thing you could do for any, any publisher or any, any system to say, turn it on, show me in Wikipedia where I can find these books or whether they're in this catalogue or whatever. Um, and in particular, the interesting thing for us in Wikipedia is them coming back and correcting the catalogue. We are have a, we'll have a, a workflow we're developing them where they can come back, send people from Wikipedia to go, oh, you know, this, this entry is wrong, come and correct it, or whatever. Um, it's a distributed social bibliography platform. Other people can run the bibliographic service if they want. Uh, it, fundamentally, it's about users to participate. I mean, it's such an obvious thing, which is, why don't we harness all these users um, who come to catalogues and who read books and read works to, to help us make a better catalogues, like much better catalogues. You know, what books did Nietzsche read? That's basically a piece of metadata. You know, that's a piece of metadata. What, you know, when Coleridge was reading this edition of Shakespeare, who was he writing about in the marginalia? Again, it's kind of actually a simple piece of metadata from one work to another. I mean, relatively complicated, but that kind of enriching of catalogues is, is really possible. Uh, and for me, at least, it's really exciting. You know, why don't I get to explore a catalogue in that richness? Um, and, and for me, what's really interesting here is we have a path back to source. You know, the British Library is the cataloguer. They are the people who will be maintaining these records going forward. I want to have a way to send them the improvements we develop back, back to them. So, to wrap up, um, the future's bright and the future's open. Um, but, but seriously, um, seriously, the day's coming when there won't be a choice. Really, I mean, th there is a kind of inevitability here of, of technology. I mean, I've, I'm not such a naive student of history to say inevitability is, is everything, but, but, you know, to go back to the structured school of this, there is there's obviously a huge tendency here, there's a particularly huge tendency in the data side of it, where there are enough people with open data that it's going to happen. So, why not join that rather than kind of resist it? Why not? We've got to find a way to move. We've got to find a way for the electricity to pay for, pay for, for people to be paid for. But that's, but that's possible in a world where we're not seeking to charge directly for the data and content. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for some very interesting um, comments there. Um, any, anybody got any, any, any questions before we, uh, before we finish this session? No? Okay, well, can I say... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I can't see. It's carried, but... Would you like to come to the microphone, please? Oh, by the light. James Clayton, Worcestershire College. I've got a question for Terry, actually. 
which is um, he talks about say taking the decision making away from academics and departments and then bring it back into the centre of the library. Isn't it better to educate the departments about the benefits of where they should be going rather than you taking away their own power? It's really just a, a practical problem that I know other libraries have found with journal big deals is that when you've got projects divided in a very granular way between many departments, if you want to acquire something which you know would be a good thing for your institution, it's just so inefficient and time consuming and difficult to get the 15 departments to agree to chip in their share of the cost and so much easier if, if the library can exert the control um, prove to the academics that it knows best what it's doing with the money and choose the things um, that will benefit the academics most. Um, while still, I mean, as I suggested, having enough money left over so that those individual things that people are absolutely desperate for can be purchased as well, whether that's a single journal subscription or, or a single e-book purchase. Okay, well, can I say thank you very much to all three speakers? Can we give them a round of applause?